The whole idea was not that the Schrodinger's cat experiment could ever be carried out, but that it made you think about the absurdity of superposition. However, as Richard Feynman said, nature is absurd. It's what happens. Hey everybody, thank you for watching Leaf by Leaf. Today I am continuing with my introduction of nonfiction books that I read into this channel with Brian Clegg's excellent, excellent, excellent 2021 book called Quantum Computing, the transformative technology of the qubit revolution. It's out from Icon Books, which is a London-based publishing company, and Brian Clegg happens to be the editor overseeing the Hot Science series, of which this book is one. They've also got books on dark matter, which makes up 95% of our universe. They've got books on AI, big data, astrobiology, and the search for life on exoplanets. They shoot for a little bit deeper than the popular science level. But I would say that this tends towards the intermediate, intermediate plus, but sort of straddles that line because it'll tend towards basic and then go back towards intermediate plus. Clegg actually does an excellent job of that balancing act of bringing people who aren't very familiar with the subject along with him. And he has a teacher's knack for analogy and simplification of complex topics. But he also dips in a little deeper where those of us who are acquainted with the basics of this topic can also be fed. You may or may not know, but in my day job, I am in information technology. I have been all of my life. I started in the IT field at the age of 15. I'm now 38. 23 years, it's all I've ever known as a day job. And my undergraduate degree is in computer science. My associate's degree is actually with a concentration in applied programming. But even before both of those degrees, I was already at work programming and web design, software development, and so on. Now I work specifically in data. But because it's my day job and because the pleasures of literature are so much more powerful and lasting for me than computer stuff, I often tend to drift away from what's happening. I stay in touch with, of course, my immediate concentrations and what I'm trying to carry out in my job so that, you know, I'm a good employee, but I often just have to lose touch with what's really going on and what's on the bleeding edge. But a few issues back in the New Yorker, there was a piece about the quantum computer that Google is at work building, and they're not the only ones. And by the time I was done with the article, I thought, man, I've really lost touch with what all's happening in the world of quantum computing and quantum algorithms and so on. So I immediately sought out a book so I could go a little bit deeper than the article did, and I found Brian Clegg's book, and I'm so excited that I did. Because right in the opening acknowledgments page, which, you know, I don't normally get a whole lot out of, he says that computer programming is an amalgam of fun and frustration, combining as it does the challenges of puzzle solving and of writing. That sentiment really rekindled what first got me in love with computers and computer science and programming. I should also make clear that really we're not traveling too far outside of the literary realm, even though I'm talking about a nonfiction book on quantum computing, because a lot of these ideas and innovations and even the philosophical thought experiments that come out of the science community inform the literary community. I think of books like Thomas Pynchon's books, Joseph McElroy, and I think of those who have shown light on the scientific mathematical elements of those books, such as Tom LeClaire in The Art of Excess. The whole world of quantum physics and the spooky stuff that goes on, as Einstein referred to it, in that lowest part of what makes up all matter has its manifestation in a lot of postmodernist literature. And so for me, I've found that reading nonfiction like this book only enhances my fiction and vice versa. 
But I appreciated this book because Brian Clegg is very, very sober-minded. He's very well-informed, very gifted at explaining things, and very sober-minded, meaning he's going to debunk myths, he's going to point out where there has been overreach. But I should also then say that I'm not always like this. When I turn to books in the nonfiction realm, I don't need hard science. In fact, I think of my book Beyond Biocentrism, which people who are diehards for hard science stick to only with what we've proven. They sort of laugh at me and ridicule me for loving that book. But I can play both sides. I can open myself to the wonder of what could be of speculative science, speculative fiction, speculative physics. But then I can also appreciate the hard, sober, facts only, and let's tamp down the imaginative mind style too, such as we get in this book. The book is split into three basic parts. The first section is all on conventional computing, hardware, programming, algorithms, memory management. He presents computing as we know it today. And at its core, what we have is a machine that harnesses the laws of physics. Even today, there's quantum physics involved, as Clegg will prove to us. We're just not harnessing the weird and strange stuff that goes on in quantum physics. But nonetheless, it's all a matter of moving data, ones and zeros today, in and out of bits. Today, those bits can only hold a one or a zero. And as we know, the hardware is slim. He does a good job, I think, breaking down all the elements of conventional computing so that we are set up to see what a gargantuan shift in technology quantum computing is. The second section gives us the quantum physics that we need. And for those of us who have kind of read and kept an ear open to all the discoveries of quantum physics, a lot of this will be review. He covers Planck and Einstein and Bohr and Schrodinger and Heisenberg and John Bell. On the computing side, he starts with Charles Babbage and Ada Lovelace, who, by the way, he debunks as typically being cited as the first programmer, and Alan Turing and John von Neumann. He brings in Richard Feynman's idea of harnessing quantum physics by building a computer that actually utilizes quantum physics to handle quantum algorithms. And then finally, in the third brilliant section, he brings computing and quantum physics together to deliver a perfectly concise, well-rounded, stimulating overview of where we are and where we are headed with quantum computing. And again, like I said, I really appreciate Clegg because all throughout the book, he's got this great charisma, where he's extremely informed, extremely knowledgeable, but he's in touch with how the general audience is probably reacting to things he's saying and presenting, and he can enter humor perfectly. Here is a sample of what his tone is like, how he handles debunking myths. Werner Heisenberg is firmly associated with the uncertainty principle. This is probably the most misused concept in all of quantum physics a discipline that is routinely misused by taking its terminology and pretending the words justify all sorts of totally fictitious concepts that have nothing to do with physics. And we get a footnote. This can be anything from quantum dishwasher tablets to suggestions that the human body is just a holographic projection of the mind. So simply thinking the right thoughts, indulging in quantum thinking, can produce quantum healing. In all these cases, the word quantum could just as easily be replaced by magic. He's constantly giving us fun factoids, such as that Ada Lovelace was the daughter of the poet Lord Byron. Alan Turing died at the age of 41 from cyanide poisoning, and it was assumed that this was a result of eating a deliberately poisoned apple, perhaps inspired by seeing the Disney film Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. However, shockingly, the apple, which was found by his bed, was never tested for poison. And he didn't go into a footnote that I was expecting there about the Apple computer logo, which is the Apple with the bite taken out of it. And a lot of people have cited that as a nod to Turing and biting that poisoned apple. But the designer of the Apple logo we all know today, Rob Janoff, says that the bite was only to give a sense of scale 
to the image and to distinguish it from a cherry. I won't go deep into all the details, but whereas I said that in conventional computing today, we have bits that can store a one or a zero, what we get with quantum computing and in quantum physics is that we can have what are called qubits, which just simply stands for quantum bits, that can hold one and or zero at the same time. They can be in superposition. And this is caused by deliberately entangling the particles. So quantum entanglement is something you may have heard of. This entanglement is mind blowing because it opens up and has even been proven to show teleportation and to show instantaneous messaging from one particle to another that's faster than the speed of light, which should not ever happen. That breaks a fundamental law of the nature of the universe. However, these qubits can be entangled in such a way to where no matter what the difference is between them, an alteration in one of them causes the opposite alteration instantaneously in the other. So skipping over a lot of material that you would get better from the book, when it comes to quantum computing, we'll be able to do things light years beyond, well, beyond light years, beyond what we do today in computing. Google has probably been the biggest benefactor of advances in quantum computing because for a search engine, it's all about speed and it's all about the best, fastest searching algorithm. And so there's some really interesting stuff, but some of the more pernicious stuff that comes out in the New Yorker article and in this book has to do with quantum encryption. The ability to provide quantum encryption will become increasingly valuable as quantum computers are introduced. Before that can happen though, quantum computers have to be built and that can't be done without making use of another application of entanglement known as quantum teleportation. There is no doubt that as and when fully functional quantum computers become readily available, some aspects of internet security will need a significant overhaul. This may all seem speculative at the moment. However, the documents leaked by Edward Snowden back in 2014 showed that the U.S. National Security Agency was running a secret program specifically to develop a quantum computer that could break internet security. And he makes note that the leaked documents seem to suggest that, if anything, the agency, the NSA, was a little behind the leading laboratories. That's a little scary. And it was also noted in that New Yorker article that there are espionage agencies out there that are currently downloading reams of internet communication that's completely encrypted. And they're not trying to unencrypt it because today's computer technology just won't do it in a feasible amount of time. They're simply just taking it and storing it. So all kinds of encrypted government communication that's going on all over the world, these agencies are just downloading it and storing it away such that as soon as we get a working quantum computer with quantum encryption and decryption, it'll be nothing to go and suddenly expose all that communication. So the Biden administration is at work to get quantum proof encryption technology in place within the next 10 years. However, Amazon, Intel, Google, IBM, and the Chinese government are all going hard after creating a quantum computer. Clegg makes it very clear that our biggest challenge is the processing apparatus itself. In order for a lot of these quantum processes to take place, the current quantum computer that's being developed at Google, for instance, has to be chilled to the coldness of the outer reaches of space before it can be used. With quantum entanglement and just quantum physics in general, you may have heard that observation of it or it coming, the particles coming into contact with the environment, with their surroundings, can cause decoherence, which means that the entanglement is lost and it's no good anymore. The uncertainty principle also says that we can't know a position and a value, I think that's a position and value, of something completely precise at the same time. We can either know the precise position or the precise value, or maybe it's speed. But in the same way, quantum computing will be a little different from today's computing would well, be a lot different in every respect. But one of the ways in which it would be different is that it looks like in order to harness quantum physics, what we will really be working with in these computations 
are probabilities. And so you won't just do one mathematical calculation, get the result, and you're good, such as today's programming. You will set up the quantum algorithm and set up everything to get it ready for the quantum processes. And you'll have to run that algorithm over and over and over and over and over, then basically take an average of the results. And so what you're really getting is probabilities of computations, which is actually good enough for search engines and fuzzy search and so on. But in order for the public at large to adopt quantum computing, we're going to have to change in such a way that we can deal with probabilities. Brian Clegg uses the great example of today's weather reporting. We get percentages of rain, chances of rain at different times of day. That's the kind of quantum computing result we're gonna see. But right now, about the best thing we've seen done by a quantum computer that millions of dollars have gone into is that it can say 15 is the product of three times five. Nonetheless, the quantum algorithms are there, the algorithms for quantum encryption are there, and the race is on to build the first high performing and fully functional quantum computer. Isn't it insane to think of people in laboratories harnessing the particles and processes that underpin the nature of reality? to execute mathematical problems. The more I think about it, the more it just expands my brain. So if you're interested in quantum physics, if you're interested in quantum algorithms, if you're interested in quantum computing, and you know a little bit about these things, but you wanna go a little bit deeper, yet not get too carried away, check out Brian Clegg's Quantum Computing from Icon Books.